Frankenstein, Chapter 11, The Monster's Tale. He began his story by describing the painful and confused sensations of his body upon coming to life. After so many years of study, I could not help but be fascinated by these details. Having told of his painful adjustment to light, heat, hunger, and thirst, his narrative took a different turn. I left your apartment and found a, pla a place to rest by the side of a brook, the monster said. I drank from the brook and then, lying down, fell asleep. It was dark when I awoke. Before I left your room, I had taken some clothing to cover myself, but I still felt cold. After many days passed, I began to distinguish the many new sensations and take to my surroundings. When I tried to imitate the lovely sounds of the animals and birds, I only heard a harsh grating sound. It frightened me. Food quickly became scarce, so I decided to find a place where it was in good supply. Wrapping myself up in my cloak, I struck across the woods towards the setting sun. Three days passed as I wandered through the woodlands and finally reached the open country. A great fall of snow had taken place the night before, and the fields were covered in a white blanket. My feet were frozen through, and walking caused me pain. I entered a small hut nearby and saw an old man preparing breakfast over a fire. When he turned and saw me, he shrieked and ran out of the hut. I saw an opportunity in this hut, which was warm and dry and contained food. I ate the bread and cheese left by the man and soon after fell asleep. The sun shone overhead when I awoke. I packed the remains of my breakfast and headed across the fields. By sunset, I had arrived at a village. I was captivated by the charming arrangement of huts, cottages, and stately houses. I entered one of the cottages. When I did so, the children there cried out and fled. Soon the whole village was alive with cries. I was now the object of a violent attack and lost no time in escaping to the open country. When I was a good distance from the village, I found a hovel attached to a poor cottage and entered into it. My place of refuge was constructed of wood, but so low that I had difficulty sitting upright in it. The floor was the earth below my feet, and wind swept in through the many holes in the walls. Still, it was dry and away from my enemies. The next morning, I examined the situation. Looking out, I saw a man and cowered inside the hut. I felt it was dangerous to make my presence known. I ate my breakfast and was about to get a little water when I heard a step. Through a small hole in the wall, I saw a young woman with a pail on her head. Her clothing was faded and worn, but clean. I was moved by her kind and gentle face, for its expression was one of deep sadness. She walked out of sight, but soon returned carrying a pail filled with milk. A young man met her. His expression held even greater pain than the woman's. I wondered what had caused these people to be so downhearted. Had they experienced the same betrayal of man now known to me in my wretchedness? I found that the wall of my hovel contained a boarded up window, which, which opened into the cottage. There was a space in the boards that allowed me to see the cottage's interior. It was one of a small room, whitewashed and clean, but with little furniture. In one corner, near a small fire, sat an old man. The young woman finished her chores and then took something out of a door, put it in the old man's hands, and sat down beside him. He used the thing to make sweet sounds. The sound brought tears to the young woman's eyes. The sun began to set, and the young man appeared with wood for the fire. He and the young woman prepared their supper. The kindness with which they did all these things tore at my heart. As darkness covered the sky, the young woman lit candles. After that, I heard the young man begin to speak. I know now that he was reading aloud to the others. A short time later, they blew out the candles and went to sleep. How I longed for a touch of kindness from these good people. Chapter 12, The Lady on Horseback. The family's daily occupations did not vary. Each day they applied themselves to their basic needs and few entertainments. I realized that the old man could not see. 
The man and woman devotedly attended to his every need. Their sadness troubled me. I wanted to know what had happened to them. Clearly, they were poor. At first, I had helped myself to some of their food, but then I tried to add to it. I also replenished their wood, doing these things while they slept. These small gifts made them very happy and filled my heart with joy. I paid close attention to everything that happened in the cottage and, and even began repeating sounds and soon learning words. The young woman was called Agatha. The man's name was Felix, and his sadness outweighed the others by far. My interest in these people was such that I felt I had to try to communicate with them. Perhaps if I could speak, they would not be so frightened of me. I could tell them my story and win their affection. My hopes were shattered when I took a look at myself in the pool of water. They too would despise me, but the old man was blind. Perhaps he would listen to my tale and plead my case to his companions. When the warmer weather arrived, the family was more active. They also had more food and seemed happier. Seeing them smile lifted my spirits as well. It gave me courage to approach the old man. Before I could do so, the family received a visit from a lady on horseback and a man who served as her guide. Felix gave a shout of joy when he saw her. She wore a dark dress and a thick black veil covered her face. She removed the veil and spoke in a lovely voice, but her language differed from that of the cottagers. Her beauty far surpassed any I had seen in my travels. Felix turned to the old man and Agatha and told them about the woman. They smiled gently at her and took her hands. They communicated with her by signs. Hours passed in this way, and soon the stranger was trying to learn their language. Finally, bedtime came, and Felix said good night to the woman. He called her Safi. In the morning, Felix and Agatha did their chores as usual. Safi sat with the old man. The days passed, their happiness increased, and so did my command of their language. The books from which Felix read also broadened my understanding of the world of men. It made me consider my own situation. Where did I fit in? What kind of man was I? I had no money and no friends. My strength was far greater, but my looks were hideous. I could be kind and gentle if given a chance, but would anyone give me a chance? The pain caused by these questions was far worse than that which I endured from cold, hunger, and thirst. Thus troubled, but still wanting to make friends with his family and the beautiful stranger, I decided to wait until I knew more about them. At as time passed, I found out the details of this family's sorrow. The old man's name was De Lacy. He was from a well-to-do and respected family in France. Not long before I came to the hut, the family had lived quite comfortably in Paris. His son Felix had served in the French military. Agatha had spent her day in pursuits, deemed suitable for a lady. Safi's father was the cause of the family's downfall, a Turkish merchant. He had lived in year, for years in Paris. For some unexplained reason, the French government seized his property and confined him in a prison. He was tried and then condemned to death, along with many in Paris. Felix was outraged by the injustice. He was so moved by the man's plight that he helped Safi's, Safi's father escape. Although he rejected all offers of a reward, Felix had fallen in love with the merchant's daughter, whom he met when she had visited her father in prison. The merchant promised the young man's Safi's hand in marriage, as long as Felix ex escorted them both out of France. Of course, Felix assured the merchant that he would take them both to a safe place and that no payment was required. Still, Felix hoped that Safi would come to love him in return. Felix was overjoyed when Safi seemed to return his affection. She sent him several letters thanking him and expressing her admiration. She told Felix her own story and the many reasons why she feared for her future. Her mother was a Christian Arab, enslaved by the Turks. Safi's father, attracted by her mother's beauty, married her. With her mother's guidance, Safi developed a love of freedom that was seriously restricted in woman. 
of her father's culture. After her mother died, Safi was terrified of returning to the East. She hoped to marry a man of her mother's faith and wanted to live in the West. Felix secured passports in the name of his father, Agatha, and himself. He used these to help the merchant and Safi escape from France. Unknown to the good and trusting Felix, the merchant had no intentions of letting Safi marry him. Meanwhile, the government of France spared no pains in discovering how the merchant escaped. They imprisoned old de Lacy and Agatha. When Felix heard the news, he decided to return home and help them. Felix's efforts to free his father and sister were unsuccessful. They were in prison for five months before the trial. They were condemned to exile from their homeland, and all of their wealth was confiscated. Thus I found them poor and miserable in a small cottage in Germany. When news of Felix's fate reached Leghorn, the dishonest merchant told his daughter to forget about him. But Safi was good and honest. Her father's betrayal disgusted her. A few days later, the merchant told Safi that the French government knew their whereabouts, and he must flee. He had hired a ship that was to set sail in a few hours. He left a servant to watch over Safi until some of his possessions, which had been saved from the French, arrived at Leghorn. Together with these things, Safi and the merchant would travel east. Not only did Safi love Felix, she felt she could never give up her freedom, nor her mother's religion. Looking through some of her father's letters, she learned the name of the village near which Felix and his family had settled. Taking some of her jewels and the money left by her father, she left Italy with an attendant and departed for Germany. Chapter 13. A Bitter reflect Rejection Safi's presence at the cottage lightened the family's burdens. I continued to hope that I too could be part of this happiness, but then I looked at my reflection in the pool and knew that my hopes were foolish. They would hate me as everyone before had. Autumn passed and the landscape began to turn bleak once again. I was unhappy and lonely. In my desperation, I gathered my courage to approach old de Lacy. My opportunity came one sunny day when Felix took the woman on a long country walk. After they left, the old man picked up his instrument to play. After a while, he began sad. He became sad and he put it down. I saw my chance. After a moment's hesitation, I proceeded to the front door. I knocked. Who is there? The old man asked. Come in. I, I entered. Pardon this intrusion, I said. I am a traveler in need of a little rest. I would be very grateful if you would allow me to remain here for a few minutes before the fire. Enter, de Lacy said. My children are not home. As I am blind, I am afraid I shall find it difficult to find food for you. Do not trouble yourself, my kind host. I have food. It is warmth and rest that I need, I said. I am now going to ask help from a family I deeply admire, but I, re I fear their rejection. Do not despair, he said, trying to comfort me. To be friendless is indeed to be unfortunate, but the hearts of men, when unprejudiced, are full of brotherly love. If these friends are good, they will listen to your pleas. Where do these friends live? Near this spot, I told him. He asked me to tell him the details of my situation, for he might be able to help. I could not restrain my cry of joy. How can I thank you, I asked. You are the first person to show me any bit of kindness. Then I heard the young people returning. I seized de Lacy's hand and cried out, Save and protect me. You and your family are the friends whom I seek. Do not desert me. At that instant, the cottage door opened, and Felix, Safi, and Agatha entered. The woman screamed. Then Agatha fainted, and Felix came at me, attempting to protect the others. I fled to my hovel, tears streaming down my face. I stayed in the hut until night fell. Then, in a rage, I ran wild through the woods. I cursed you, and I cursed the day on which my body knew life. Exhausted, I fell asleep on some leaves. When dawn came, I rose and heard men's voices. Felix had given the alarm, and I was again in danger of attack. I hid in some thick bushes and tried to calm myself. Perhaps de Lacy would tell Felix what I had said. Maybe if I returned, they would not reject me. 
My mind was clouded in a swirl of thoughts. Worn out, I fell into a fitful sleep. When I awoke, I felt hungry. I found some food and then walked toward the cottage. It was quiet and peaceful. No one was moving about, doing errands or enjoying their pleasant sunshine. Felix soon appeared with another man. Felix said that he must take his family from this place. He said that their lives were in danger, and so he left, and I saw no more of the family that I had come to love. It was then that I truly knew utter misery. I desired revenge on all those who had tormented and rejected me. I reserved my worst com condemnations for you, Frankenstein. You created me, and then you abandoned me. The pain was too great at that moment. I had to relieve it in some way. I lit a dry tree branch and fanned the flames. Using the branch, I set the cottage and hut on fire. I wanted with glee. I watched with glee as they burned to the ground. I remembered hearing you mention Geneva as your home. Geography had been the, trop the topic of many conversations in the cottage, and I had learned how to find a way there. My travels took considerable time. I suffered greatly from hunger and bad weather. These trials increased my anger. I had one thought only, to find you and make you pay for my suffering. Chapter 14. The Monster Goes to Geneva I made the journey and rejoiced when Geneva came into view one evening. I rested in the fields surrounding the city while trying to decide on my next course of action. My thoughts were interrupted by the approach of a beautiful child. It occurred to me that perhaps this little creature was unprejudiced and had lived too short a time to know fear. He might not run in horror from me. I took hold of him as he passed, but as soon as he looked at my face, he screamed and struggled violently. Let me go. My papa is Alphonse Frankenstein. He will punish you if you do not let me go, the boy cried. Frankenstein, you belong to my enemy. Ah, you shall be my first victim, I said. Before I knew what had happened, the, boy, the child lay still at my feet. Triumphantly, I looked down at him and saw something glittering on his chest. It was a portrait of a lovely woman. I ran wildly around until I saw a barn, which was empty. Inside, a woman was sleeping on some straw. She was young and held the broom of life and the promise of happiness. I bent over her and she stirred. The thought of her screaming and running away from me was unbearable. I put the child's locket in her pocket. If I must suffer, then she would too. The locket would be found and she would be put to death as the child's murderess. Revenge would be mine. Hear me now, Victor Frankenstein. My deeds have repulsed you and caused your life to be bitter. More pain is your lot unless you create a being, a woman who is my equal, to be a comfort and joy when all others have forsaken me. Listening to the last part of this story, I hung my head in despair. How could I let this being loose upon the world and with a companion capable of doing the same evil deeds? I refuse. I replied, as long as you walk the earth, there is one too many evildoers to terrorize men. He said, if you will do this, you will never see either of us again. I will take my bride to the farthest end of the earth. I replied, I know you to be a fiend and a murderer. How do I know that you will be a peaceful and contented? He looked sadly at me. You owe this to me. Alone, I am a fiend. With love, I can be kind and gentle, he said. Did I owe him at least a chance at some happiness? I hesitated. Then I said, I will do as you ask, but only if you promise to leave Europe forever and every other place where man can be found. I swear, he cried, if you grant my wish, you will never see either of us again. I will leave you now, but I will be watching you. I will know when you have finished your work. Then I will come back to receive the companion of my dreams. After he left, I wandered aimlessly. Night was far advanced. When I was halfway back to Geneva, I wept bitterly. It was well into the morning when I reached the village. I gathered my things at the inn and immediately left for Geneva. I was in quite a state when I walked through the door of our family home. My wild appearance alarmed everyone. They asked many questions, but I refused to answer. 
I went to my room, dreading the day I would start to fulfill my promise to the monster. Chapter 15, Victor's Dilemma. Although I had much to do to prepare for my gruesome task, I couldn't find the courage to begin. It would take weeks to collect all of the necessary materials, and I had had more research to do, but my health had improved and my mind was clear. In such a state, my promise to the monster did not seem so urgent. There still were times when a deep gloom covered me, but then I kept to myself. I passed those days on the lake alone in a little boat, watching the clouds and listening to the rippling of the waves. It was after my return from one of these rambles that my father called me aside. He remarked on the change in my appearance and spirits, but he said that he was concerned by my reluctance to talk freely among the family. He asked me if my reluctance had to do with Elizabeth and if there was another to whom I had promised my affection. I was shocked by his speech. I assured him that I felt no pressure to fulfill an unspoken obligation that was understood since our childhood. I loved Elizabeth even more now than I ever had back then. Greatly relieved, he suggested an immediate union between us. To me, the idea of marrying Elizabeth at this time was out of the question. My promise to the monster once again seemed urgent. I could not hope to give Elizabeth any happiness while the monster stalked me. And if I was to form another being, I knew I could not do it here. The strain I would be under would be too great. I told my father that I wanted to travel to England prior to the wedding. He agreed to my request. He and Elizabeth secretly asked Henry to join me at Strasbourg and continue on with me to England. While this limited the amount of solitude I would have for my work, I welcomed Henry's companionship. I also promised myself that once the work was done, I could marry Elizabeth. This indeed was a reason to move forward with my dismal task. I did not worry about the monster troubling the family in my presence or in my absence, for I felt sure that he would follow me to England. I left at the end of September, two days after I arrived, Henry arrived. Our plan was to travel down the Rhine in a boat from Strasbourg to Rotterdam. From there, we would take a ship to London. On a clear, mor uh, clear morning near the end of December, we first saw the white cliffs of Britain, and finally the numerous steeples of London appeared. Chapter 16, Two Friends Abroad We decided to remain in London for several months. Henry's thirst for adventure and love of learning was ignited by the many opportunities this city had to offer. Had I not created the fiend that, I, that now haunted my dreams, I would have been equally excited by this city. Now I only dreaded what I had come to do in this place. Henry intended to visit India, and he believed that in England he could best prepare for the journey. He was very busy and often asked me to accompany him on his errands. As I was now collecting materials for the monster's companion, and I needed my solitude, I frequently turned down his invitations. In February, we received an invitation from a Scottish friend we had made in Geneva to visit him in Scotland. We accepted and planned to travel north the following month. After spending a week in Edinburgh, we were on our way to Perth, where our Scottish friend met us. But I was in no mood to laugh and talk with strangers. I told Henry that I wished to make the tour of Scotland alone and would meet him back here in about a month's time. He tried to talk me out of it, but seeing my determination, he wished me well. I hoped to find a remote area where I could do my work. I firmly believed that the monster was following me and, and would find me when I had fulfilled my promise to him. I chose the most remote island of the or Orkneys as my workplace. One of the island's three, uh, three huts was unoccupied. The hut had two rooms, one I could use as my laboratory, but it needed many repairs. I hired some men to do the repairs and brought some furniture. Here in this desolate and shabby place, I settled down to do my work. One evening, as I sat in my laboratory, my thoughts were diverted to the monster's pleas for mercy and compassion. The sun had set, and the moon was just rising from the sea. 
Since I did not have enough light to continue my work, I let my mind consider more deeply the promise I had made. There were no guarantee that the monster could fulfill his side of the bargain. If he alone could do such evil things, what might two, two such beings accomplish? My heart sank with this thought. Just at that moment when I looked up, I saw his face, lit by the moon's glow, staring through my window. A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips. Enraged, I tore my handwork to pieces. When he saw me destroy his future mate, he screamed and ran away in a wild frenzy. At that moment, I vowed never to comply with his wishes. Several hours passed in which I gazed at the sea. The shock and horror of seeing the monster's face had filled me with despair. At some point during the night, I heard the paddling of oars. Someone had landed a boat on the shore and was making his way to my door. He opened the door and walked through the passage to the room in which I rested. As I feared, it was the monster. Once again, he accused me of destroying his chances of happiness. Go away, I cried. He threatened to make me even more miserable than I already was, but I held my ground. Your threats do not scare me, I said. They only convince me that I am right to deny your wishes. Be gone. Trouble humanity no more. Beware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful, he answered. I will watch for opportunities to strike back. Beware. Devil, I cried. I will go, he said but I will be with you on your wedding night. I rushed at him, attempting to seize him, but he ran out of the hut. I heard him climb into his boat and paddle away. Chapter 17. The Monster Strikes Again When morning came, I left the hut and walked around the island, wishing that I could pass the rest of this wretched life here. I saw a fishing boat land close to me. One of the men aboard brought me a packet containing letters from Geneva. There was one from Henry requesting that I meet him at Perth so we could travel south together. His request stirred me to action. Under the cover of night, I put my instruments in a basket filled with stones. I boarded a little boat and sailed out about four miles from shore. A few boats were returning to the island, but no one seemed to notice me. I flung the basket overboard and lay down in the boat to rest. When I awoke, the sun had already risen, the wind was strong, and I could not navigate my course, and I wasn't familiar enough with the area to know where I was directed. I spent quite a few hours in fear of being lost, stranded, or drowned, but these dark thoughts were relieved when I saw land up ahead. I made a sail with part of my clothing and steered the boat toward the shore. As I got closer, I could make out a small town with a harbor. A man came close and said, Come, sir, you must follow me to Mr. Kerwin's to give an account of yourself. Who is Mr. Kerwin? I asked. Why am I to give an account of myself? Mr. Curran, Kerwin is a magistrate, the man said. You are to give an account of the death of a gentleman who was found murdered here last night. I stood before the crowd in shock. I had been accused of murder in a strange place with no friends or family to, to come to my aid. Mr. Kirwin was a kind and gentle man, but the look on his face told me that the accusation was serious. One witness came forward to say that he had been out fishing the night before with his son and brother-in-law. At about ten o'clock they felt a strong wind and decided to return to the port. They did not land at the harbor, but at a creek about two miles below. He walked on ahead while his companions followed at some distance. His foot struck against something on the ground and he fell. When his companions reached him, they helped him up, but the light of their lantern, they saw that the object was the body of a man who, it appeared, was dead. The person had not drowned, for his clothes were dry and the body was not yet cold. The man had carried the body to the cottage of an old woman close by. When they examined the body, they judged that he had been strangled to death since there were some black marks on his neck. As the mention of the huge fingers, the monster came to mind. I trembled, and I saw Mr. Curran take note of my agitation. 
The fisherman's son-in-law then spoke up to say that he had seen a boat near shore and a single man was on board. Other people came forward to confirm and add to this testimony. Clearly, these people thought that I had killed the man. When the testimonies were finally completed, Mr. Curran took me into another room to view the body. He, How can I describe my dismay at seeing before me the cold and stiff body of my beloved friend Henry? Henry, who had been so young and full of life, with a great future before him, was dead, and my monster was to blame. A swirl of confusion swam over me. The next thing I knew, I was in a prison, stretched out on a miserable cot, and surrounded by iron bars and guards. Two months, I, ra I lay raving. I lay raving and feverish, with only Mr. Curran to show me some kindness and compassion. He did not visit often, but he made sure that I had the best room in the prison and a nurse to watch over me. As Mr. Curran seemed to know a bit about me, I asked how he had come to this information. He replied that he had read through all the papers that had been found in my possession and had contacted my father, Mr. Curran. Mr. Curran, uh, I mean, Mr. Curran assured me that all was well in Geneva. In fact, someone from Geneva was on his way to visit me. Mr. Curran left me for a few moments and returned with my father. We embraced, and he told me that everyone at home was in good health. Then sadness came over his features as he mentioned poor Henry. What could I say? I just stared in anguish at both my father and Mr. Curran. Before long, they left me to rest. My father stayed on until the trial, which took place after I had spent three months in prison. Mr. Curran arranged for my defense, and all went smoothly. I was set free, but this gave me no joy. The future looked bleak. I would go back to back home with my father and Mary Elizabeth, but the monster would now stalk us both. Who would be his next victim? Chapter 18. Victor Marries Elizabeth. I was deeply troubled throughout our voyage home. Our first shop was Paris. I'm, I'm sorry, my eyes are so blurry right now. <laughs> our first stop was Paris, and my father judged that we should stop here while I gathered my strength. He was alarmed, and I kept blaming myself for the deaths of William, Justin, and now Henry. Hoping to keep me calm, he avoided any subject that would lead my thoughts to these misfortunes. In the middle of May, we decided to start our journey home. A few days before we left Paris for Switzerland, I received a letter from Elizabeth. Her words were comforting, but brought to mind the monster's parting threat. Would he find us on our wedding night? How could I protect my beloved Elizabeth? Before leaving Paris, I wrote back to her that my heart was set on our union. I vowed to myself that I would not let the monster destroy my beloved I felt that I must reveal my terrible secret to her, but not until after we were married. I told her this this in my letter, but urged her not to think about it until after the wedding. A week later, I was standing before her, and all thoughts of the monster fled from my mind. She was thinner and had lost much of her childlike exuberance. Looking at her trusting face, I became more enraged at the monster's wish to destroy our future happiness. When my father urged that we set a date for the wedding, I half-heartedly complied. I felt as though fate were pulling me along, and I did not have the strength to do anything but follow. After the ceremony, a large party gathered at our house to celebrate. It was agreed that Elizabeth and I would leave right away to begin our honeymoon journey by sea. Those were my last moments of happiness. The weather was beautiful, the scenery breathtaking, and I was with my beloved. It was eight o'clock when we landed at Evian, Evian. We walked for a short time on the shore and then returned to the inn. The wind, which had fallen in the south, now rose with great violence in the west. The moon had risen, and clouds swept across it and dimmed its rays. Suddenly, a, a heavy rainstorm broke. Every sound terrified me but I was determined to defend my bride at any cost. Elizabeth asked, What is it that troubles you, Victor? I told her that all would be well, but I did not want her to witness the battle I expected. I told her to go to bed and that I would soon join her. 
After she left, I walked up and down the hallways of the inn and inspected every corner. There was no trace of the monster. Just when I had decided that, perf that perhaps we were safe, I heard Elizabeth scream. I ran to our room. There she lay, lifeless, across the bed. I cried out in pain and threw myself down on the floor. Soon a crowd of people formed outside the room. They were alarmed by the screams that had echoed throughout the inn. I hung over Elizabeth's body. A streak of light from the pale moon came through the open window, drawing my attention. Looking in was the face of the monster. I rushed toward the window, but he fled. A group of men went, in, went outside to look for the murderer, and I tried to follow, but I was seized by a fit. Some of the men carried me back inside and placed me on a bed. I was hardly conscious of what had happened. My eyes wandered around the room as if to seek something that I had lost. My one clear thought was to return to Geneva. Delivering the news to my father was the most painful thing I had ever endured. He broke under the strain of losing Elizabeth whom he considered his only daughter. It was not long before he too died. For months after that, I was confined to a cell and treated as a madman. When I had stopped raving, I was released, but freedom meant nothing to me now. I sought one thing, revenge. I told my tale to a magistrate, hoping to get his help to hunt down the demon. The magistrate was kind and patient. He did not question the truth of my story, but he said it would be impossible to capture a man of such, such strength and endurance. He asked me where the monster was now. When I told him that I did not know, the magistrate said that it was possible that the monster was far from Geneva already, which would make it even more difficult to capture him. I left the magistrate and decided to take justice into my own hands. Chapter 19 Victor Seeks Revenge Before leaving Geneva, I visited the graves of William, Elizabeth, and, and my father. I vowed to capture the demon who had ruined my life. A loud and fiendish laugh rang out to answer me. The monster shouted, I am satisfied, miserable wretch. You have determined to live, and I am satisfied. I darted toward the spot from which the sound came, but the monster was gone when I got there. Suddenly, the broad disk of a moon arose and shone full upon his ghastly and distorted shape as he fled with more than mortal speed. I spent many months traveling in pursuit, following clues left behind by the fiend. I saw him board a ship heading for the Black Sea, too. I, too, boarded the ship, but he had escaped. Sometimes he left clues for me to find. He led me to the most desolate, barren places, far from all traces of civilization. I do not know how I was able to survive the hardship, hunger, and thirst. I believe that a spirit gave me strength to fulfill my promise to make the demon pay for his crimes. As I moved northward, the landscape grew more snowy and cold. Everything, it seemed, turned to ice. Some weeks before this period, I had hired a sled and dogs, which greatly aided my progress over the snow and ice. I now gained on. I now gained on him so much so that when I saw the ocean, he was but one day's journey ahead of me. Two days later, I arrived at a hamlet on the seashore. Some of the inhabitants had seen the monster and pointed out his direction. He had arrived the night before, armed with many pistols. He had carried off their store of winter food. Taking a sled and a team of trained dogs, he continued his journey across the sea in a direction that led to no, sand, to no land. I exchanged my land sled for one more suited to the frozen ocean and purchased a plentiful stock of provisions. I departed from land. I don't know how many days passed since then, but I endured much misery and hardship in my pursuit. I almost gave in to despair, but then I looked over the sea of ice before me. I saw a dark spot on the horizon. It was a sled. A board with, was a huge figure. My heart leaped with joy. I must keep going. I urged the team on and followed the speck for nearly two days. I gained on him, and soon I was no more than a mile away from him. But now, when I appeared almost within grasp of my enemy, the ice began to break up. 
In a few minutes, the, the sea was let loose with sw and swelled between the monster and me. I was left drifting on a piece of ice that continued to break up. Several of my dogs died, and I was about to collapse when I saw your vessel. I was able to reconstruct with uh, oars with pieces of the sled, and by this means I moved my ice raft to the direction of your ship. Swear to me, Walton, that if I die, you will seek him and put an end to his life. When I am dead, if he should appear, swear that he will not be allowed to continue to murder the innocent. He certainly will try to gain your compassion, but do not trust him. He will continue his miserable acts until he is stopped. Chapter 20. Walton continues the story. To Mrs. Saville, England, August 26, 1700. Dear Margaret, now that you have read this strange and terrifying tale, I have no doubt that you question its truth. I must tell you that I believe the story. His face, his voice, everything about this man spoke of the pain and hardship he endured during these trials. Frankenstein discovered that I made notes concerning his history. He asked to see them and them corrected and added to them in many places. I was the only thing he would not relate to me was how he had formed the monster. He told me to learn from his mistakes and not indulge a curiosity that would lead to a similar fate. Thus, thus a week had passed while I have listened to him tell of his experiences, each one more amazing than the last. I wish to soothe him, yet what can I say to one so miserable? His dreams, he says, are one are his one consolation in them he his loved ones visit him and restore in him a measure of peace our conversations are not always so painful sometimes he becomes quite animated as we discuss literature and other subjects that are dear to his heart before his trial he must have been a noble being his intelligence and wisdom have made a strong impression on me r w to mrs seville England, September 2nd, 1700. My dear sister, I am surrounded by mountains of ice and I'm fearful for our future. It gives me great pain to think of endangering the lives of the men who trust me in this way. If we are lost, my mad schemes are the cause and what, Margaret, will become of you? I do not want you to wait anxiously for word of our safety or of your of our ruin. But you have a husband and lovely children. May you all be happy, come what may. Frankenstein, Frankenstein's presence with us has been a blessing. He reminds me of how often the same accidents have happened to other pioneers. Even the sailors are, are cheered and reassured by the words of his encouragement. With love, Robert Walton. To Mrs. Seville, England, 175. I mean, September 5, 1700. We are still surrounded by mountains of ice. The cold is unbearable. And many of my unfortunate comrades have died. Frankenstein is ill and his health declines with each day. I fear that the remaining crew members are planning a mutiny. This morning, a dozen of the, of the sailors barged into the cabin. Their leader told me that he and his companions had been chosen by the other sailors to come and insist that if by some miracle the ice dissolved and the way made clear for travel, we must change our course and return to the south. I admit that I did not want to give up yet, even if my men felt that their lives were in danger. I still had my dreams of glory. Yet could I, ref could I refuse this de their demand? As I hesitated, Frankenstein spoke up. What do you mean? Are you? Then, then so easily turned from your duty. Are you then so easily turned from your duty? Did you not call this a glorious expedition? If it be glorious, it will not be because the way it was smooth. It will be because you overcame danger and had the courage to persevere through hardship and deprivation. Return as heroes who have fought and conquered. The men looked at one another and were unable to reply. I told them to reconsider what had been said. I promised that I would not lead them farther north if they did not want to proceed, but that I hoped their courage would return. After they left us, I turned toward my friend, and he was so weak he could no longer speak. 
I do not know how this will end, Margaret. I do know that I will survive long enough to notify you of our decision. R.W. To Mrs. Seville, England, September the 12th, 1700. Beloved sister, it is settled. We are returning to England. My dream has come to an end, and I have lost my noble friend. I will tell you of his death, dear sister. On September 9, the ice began to move. The sound of cracking like thunder filled the air. The islands of ice began to dissolve in every direction. Although we were in grave danger, my, uh, my main concern was for Frankenstein. He was very ill and confined to his bed. The ice cracked behind us and was driven with force toward the north. A breeze sprang up from the west, and on the 11th, a passage toward the south became clear. When the, sail when the sailors saw this, they shouted for joy. Frankenstein, who had been do dozing, dozing, woke up and asked what had happened. They are happy, I said, because they will soon return to England. Then you will return, he asked, looking disappointed. I must, I answered. Do so if you must, but I cannot go with you. I am weak, but surely the spirits who have come to my aid before will help me to accomplish my task. He tried to raise from the bed, but fell back and fainted. It was long, hard, until we, until he regained consciousness. His, he breathed with difficulty and was unable to speak. The surgeon gave him some medicine and asked the others not to disturb him. In private, the surgeon told me that my friend had certainly not many hours to live. I sat by my friend's bed and watched him. His eyes were closed, and I thought he was sleeping. After a while, he called me in a feeble voice. The strength I relied on is gone, he said. I feel that I will die soon, and my enemy may still be alive. I no longer feel the hatred toward him that I felt these past months, but I feel myself justified in des desiring his death. In a fit of madness, I gave life to this creature and was then obligated, as far as it was in my power, to attend to his happiness and well-being. Still, I owed far more to my fellow men. I could not allow this demon to murder more innocent victims. The task of his destruction was mine. But I have failed. I once again ask that you fulfill this task now that my life is coming to an end. He hesitated for a moment. When he continued, he said, But I cannot ask you to forsake your own future. Farewell, Walton. Seek happiness and peace and avoid ambition. His voice grew fainter as he spoke. He sank in silence about an hour and a half. Later, he tried to speak but was unable. He pressed my hand feebly and his eyes closed forever. Margaret, what can I say to describe this man? What can I say that will help you understand the depth of my sorrow on losing this noble creature? Then I thought I would never find, uh, then I thought I would never find has come only to leave so soon. It is midnight and I should retire now, but I am interrupted. What do these sounds mean? They come from the cabin where Frankenstein rests, still and cold. I must go see who is disturbing his peace. Good night, my sister. Yours truly, Robert Dalton. To Mrs. Seville, England, sep September 13, 1700. Dear Margaret, if Frankenstein's tale seemed incredible to you, what I am about to write will certainly shock you. I entered Frankenstein's cabin and saw, towering over him, the monster of which he spoke. Long locks of ragged hair hid his face. When he heard me approaching, he sprang toward the window. I was then able to see fully his hideous face and figure. I closed my eyes, repulsed by this vision of horror. He looked like an animated mummy. He is also my victim, he exclaimed. Oh, Frankenstein, I now ask you to pardon me, but it is it is too late to receive your forgiveness. I approached him, but not, but dared not raise my eyes to his face. There was something unearthly about his ugliness. I tried to speak, but choked on the words. Finally, I pulled myself together and addressed him. Your request for forgiveness is indeed too late. Frankenstein is gone, and you are the cause. Do you think that he was the only one to suffer? He asked. 
I only wanted friendship. I was good and desired goodness until man turned his back on me and made me an enemy. It was only then that I began my evil ways. You may hate me, but it is nothing compared to the hatred I feel for myself. I was at first touched by the pain on his face, but I recalled what Frankenstein had said about the monster and about how he would try to regain my sympathy. I did not allow myself to be taken in by the monster. You are a most wretched creature, I cried. If you are in pain, it is certainly not because you feel sorry for your crimes. It is true that I am a wretch. Replied, he replied, I have murdered the lovely and the helpless. I have tormented my creator and caused endless misery. Fear not, my work is nearly complete. One more death is required, and it is my own. Soon Frankenstein's monster will, will be no more. Farewell. With that, he sprang from the cabin window. He was soon swept away by the waves into the dark distance, never to be seen again. Here, my dear Margaret, ends the sad story of Victor Frankenstein and his monster. The end. Sorry, it was a bit choppy. <laughs> it's my new glasses that I'm wearing. <laughs> and um, some of the words seemed a little bit blurry. It, it will take a little time for me to become acclimated to these spectacles. They are uh, bifocals. <laughs> so that was... Um, so it's going to take a little bit of time, but anyway, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed that. Good night.